Welcome to the Caregiver Reality Show with your hosts, David Levy and Paul Vadiato, who bring you more than a combined 25 years of practical experience, helping thousands of family caregivers, helping them find solutions to the challenges and frustrations presented by this important responsibility. So if you are in the position of caring for a spouse or a parent, a loved one who is no longer able to care for themselves, or if you know someone who is, this hour will be worth the listening. Now, let's tune in to today's edition of Caregiver Reality with your hosts, David Levy and Paul Vadiato. Good evening, South Florida, America, and the world. It's Tuesday, 5 o'clock drive time here on the East Coast, so you're listening to the Caregiver Reality Hour. Hopefully, you're watching us on caregiverreality.com, amp2.com, WWNN, iHeartRadio or 1470 AM right here in our own backyard. And uh, looking forward to the show tonight. Actually, we have a call-in guest that we had once before. His name is Dan McGrath. He was the one that brought you all of that very interesting information on Social Security and Medicare. But because of some problems that we had that night with Skyping and Echo, uh, his message was too important to leave, and right. so we've asked him to come back tonight and um, and repeat what he had to say because it's a very important message. Matter of fact, uh, somebody in the hallway here at the at the station got into a discussion with Paul, who is the financial maven amongst us, and he was explaining a little of what the Dan McGrath story is, and he said, "Well, maybe I can't retire." And uh, we don't want to scare you folks, but certainly you need to know what's Mm -hmm. coming about and and really what's going on. Uh, Paul and I are about to uh, leave in the morning. Uh, We're heading over to Tampa. We have uh, business tomorrow. But Thursday, uh, Scott Solkoff and the Solkoff Law Firm will be putting on the West Coast version of Elder Concert, which we were a part of at the florida atlantic university campus uh, a couple of weeks back it was a great success we hope that uh, the participation and the people that we'll meet in tampa will be just as enthusiastic and uh, we're really looking forward to it the only thing i'm not looking forward to paul is it looks like the weather is going to get very difficult you know we've had three days of gorgeous weather here in florida and that's three more than <laughs> maybe we rightly had the opportunity to expect. But nonetheless, we're putting on our rain slickers and heading west uh, from where we are. And um, Paul, the ever popular question of the day, how was your week? Well, first of all, good evening, David, and good evening to our listeners. And once again, thank you all for being part of the Caregiver Reality Hour experience. Thank you for all of your participation facebook twitter uh we really appreciate your input your insights and your thoughts and we're glad that you're part of our family here at caregiver reality hour david uh you know i am so fortunate to be able to say tonight and to our listeners that debbie really had a great week it just seems that the stars aligned and all of the troubles that we had seem to have simmered down a little bit and we really had a uh, a week of normalcy, which was abnormal in and of itself over right. there. And I was telling you before we came on air, I had gotten a phone call from a uh, a friend of a friend, and relating stories of uh, a preemie that was born at one pound came home, uh, taking care of a a dad who has some some uh, dementia and physical problems, and is really struggling. So you know. It sort of puts things in perspective. You know, when you're going through it at any given moment, it sure hurts. And we suffer the same stresses as caregivers as everyone else. But somewhere else down the road, there's somebody who has a little bit more difficult. And uh, take your blessings and take the joys where you find them. Right. And no one can ever take comfort in the fact that somebody else is worse. There's no. always somebody else that, that's worse. As my mother, my late mother used to say, bless her. Um, your pneumonia doesn't make my cancer feel any better. No question about it. And and so there's a lot of truth in that. Um, How about Suzette? How's uh, she doing? We were the flip side of you. This Uh was not a good week at all. 
Um, she's having a lot of difficulty. A lot of some of the underlying chronicity um, is is starting to rear its head. Um, one of the things that you used to complain about that Debbie, because of her nursing background and the availability of the internet, can uh, turn what might be an ordinary event for everybody else into a rolling disaster. Well, mine pulled out all the paperwork on um, the issues that she has mm -hmm. and uh, went back through it and is now afraid that it's morphing into something else that is even worse than what she has. I tell her, don't jump the gun, but you can't stop somebody who's got a brain who's been going through this. She called around to some of the other folks that have what she has, and um, nobody was very optimistic that it wasn't what she thought. I'm hoping that, you know, it won't be. I'm being a little cryptic, folks, because to get into the specifics um, does nobody any good. And uh, it, it, it's a real orphan disease, and it has a lot of manifestations to it. And when it decides to push on into other territories, shall we say, it can be very, very problematic. So this wasn't a great week. Um, she's not thrilled that we're going away tomorrow, oh, but I told her it's only one night. Trust and, me, I know. And we have separate rooms. <laughs> And uh, <laughs> and that uh, she doesn't have to worry, and the phone rings no matter where we are on the turnpike or Route 60 heading to Tampa. But uh, moving forward, as I said, we have Dan McGrath tonight and uh, that Elder concert on Thursday. And I, I gather the turnout is going to be fairly substantial. And so we're looking forward to doing it. And then we'll hurry up and get back in order to be back here. For Thursday. Paul, I think we need to get into the discussion of the headline that's sitting in front of you right now. Oh, I know. All right. And, I, I just um, why don't we both take a little bit of a piece of it and why don't you kind of start it off? Well, for those of you who live in Florida probably have seen it and for those that have not, uh, on the ballot coming up in November is this issue of the use of legal medical marijuana in a uh, in a medical situation as as a therapy and right proposition couple, two proposition two and a couple of weeks ago we had dr bruce hinden who is a uh, pain management physician talk about it as being one of many many protocols well obviously on any side of an issue people are going to agree or disagree and we're not here to discuss the politics of it we're not here to discuss Positive or negative. Right. That's up to the voters. Whatever they vote, they vote. And what's in your heart. But what really offended me to no end was the running of an ad that was using caregivers as the reason why this proposition should be defeated. Because caregivers do not have background checks or they are not medically trained and they ended the commercial with saying it really is the Drug Dealer Protection Act. Yeah, and I think that we all have to realize, you know, there are caregivers in every category. Sure. The doctors, nurses, social workers are caregivers. There are paid caregivers. There are 60 million people that are unpaid caregivers that we talk about all the time. And many times hospice workers go to somebody's home and leave morphine there in the refrigerator because somebody's going to need it. I don't know that just because you're a caregiver, you're out dealing it on the street. And the thing that I find truly absurd is that most caregivers for people that cannot get out of the house or any other, you know, circumstance where they're limited, they're in a facility, what have you, pick up their prescriptions all the time. It can be oxycodone, it can be Xanax, it can be any one of the controlled substances. Do we think for one moment that they're running outside and, and selling it in the street? I'm sure to some degree, some of that happens. There's bad apples in every in, barrel. In every barrel, but to take caregivers across the board and turn them into drug dealers is not only ridiculous in even the proposition but it's offensive 
Yes. All right? I pick up my wife's medications all the time, as you do. Mm -hmm. Some of them are definitely controlled level C or, you know, class one, whatever it may happen to be. Um, I don't take those pills and run out and, and, and look for somebody around the corner to give them to or sell them to. And, you know, marijuana has been around for a long time. It's been abused. It hasn't been abused. It's called the gateway drug. And I really don't want to minimize. But, I mean, somebody goes to the dispensary after they've been qualified to pick it up. They're not taking a bail. They're getting a little bit, whatever the heck the dosage is. And, and it's supposed to be the non-hallucinatory variety. Okay? And so how do you turn that kind of a situation into casting every caregiver as a drug dealer and that's the point that we wanted to bring out tonight not the issue of whether marijuana should be legalized that's up to the voters but that you can't take 60 70 million people who are caregivers and because they may be responsible for picking up a medication for a loved one that turns them into a felon and a drug dealer well doctors nurses uh paramedics all of these people in some definition are caregivers of course they are and to besmirch so many qualified dedicated people in addition to the people who are home taking care of loved ones it is it is just blatantly unfair and truly truly offensive and I hope they pull these ads before the election and well, people they aren't they, they won't and I'm, people aren't going to be swayed by this just smear right. campaign it's awful mm. Take your issue and believe what you believe in your heart, but don't look to the caregiver to be an excuse for you not to vote or for you not to take the position that, that you believe in. And if it's no, it's no. If it's yes, it's yes. But as the Caregiver Reality Hour and who Paul and I both in the last 50 some odd years that we've been involved in this, um, we just can't sit idly by and, and let the caregiver get thrown under the bus. And that was the whole purpose in raising this subject today, was to say, caregivers, you're doing a great job, and irrespective of what medication you may be picking up for your loved one, nobody is accusing you of being a drug dealer, a felon, or that you're going to turn it into a business. God knows your job as a caregiver is difficult enough, and you're doing it with the best you can with love with sincerity not right to be casting aspersions across such a wide brush and, and painting people with the title of felon and drug dealer right i mean i think we've made our point i, I think, don't so think too. i i i don't want to you know we, we've given you the shoes in the box we don't need to sell you the string but <laughs> We're very defensive of caregivers since both Paul and I are and the millions of people out there who are don't deserve the label. Um, before we move on, Paul, did, uh, did you want to say anything about um, what's going on out there in the, after, after we had spent the week at the, at the breakers doing... Uh, well, yes. Uh, as you might remember from last week's show... Uh, Kathleen Bigsby from the Canyon was our guest, and uh, David and I spent a week at the Moments of Change conference, and we spoke to some extraordinarily talented individuals across that wide spectrum of, of addiction recovery, interventionists, psychologists, psychiatrists. Uh, a lot of issues were discussed, and as more and more of them that we spoke to started asking the question well what is it that you do and we spoke about the role of the family and not only the family in some cases as being part of the problem but in more cases than not really suffering the same pangs as any other caregiver sort of a light bulb began to come on and people recognized that they needed the support and the help as also and we're very anxious to continue that relationship with the right. uh, and going foundation forward, recovery network right and going forward uh next month we'll be this month we're going to be having a series of folks on we're just in the process of of getting them lined up but 
we want to take an event that happens in a lot of lives that starts with a 911 call mm -hmm. and a paramedic or a fireman coming through the door next week. I trust that we will have um, somebody on who's really, really a, a phenomenal paramedic fireman. Um, the following week, we'd like to have on, and I'm trying to make those arrangements now, an ER physician. What happens when the handoff comes from the red truck into the mm -hmm. hospital? And then from the emergency room up onto the floor, what goes on there? And we're working very hard right now to get a hospitalist, somebody who is strictly in the hospital, caring for the patients on the floor, what their perspective is, and then possibly after that to discuss where one goes if they're not going home and issues such as nursing home, assisted living, um, and areas such as that. You know, there it's a growing industry, but um, this past week, all right, Richard Molo, M-O-L-L-O-T, who is the executive director of the Long-Term Care Coalition, Mm -hmm. uh, came out with a set of commentaries that I think are worthy of at least putting out. And uh, once again, this is his position, but it's based on a lot of fact. And it's, you know, and there's a lot of myth and stereotype surrounding what happens when people go into facilities, good, bad, and otherwise. Mm -hmm. And he made the comment that despite strong standards to ensure that nursing home residents receive good care and are treated with dignity and in a humane manner, a recent federal study found that an astounding one in three people who go to a nursing home for short-term rehab, this isn't your long-term client, are harmed. Close to 60% of that harm was determined to be preventable. Approximately 20% of nursing home residents receive dangerous antipsychotic drugs to gain a level of what we call chemical compliance. All right, and we're not painting everybody with that brush but when you have these facilities, they're jammed. There are a whole level of people that are both compliant and not compliant. And you want to do Break something Break that down about a little bit. Exactly what does that mean, David? Well, what it means is we can't strap them in a wheelchair and we can't tie them to their beds because that's absolutely against the law. That's restraining. However, if we can find a doctor or somebody that's affiliated with the nursing home to say, well this person has aggressive behavior, so let's uh, prescribe certain uh, tranquilizers, sleeping pills, et cetera, that will keep them from being aggressive, from keeping them from, let's say, interfering with what everybody else has to do. There's a time and a place for those meds, but when you see that 20% of the nursing home residents receive these drugs, despite the FDA's warning, that they're unsafe for people with dementia. But at times, people with dementia can be aggressive, mm -hmm. can be inappropriate. We know that. It's part of the disease. And to go and, tr and treat them with antipsychotics when we know that dementia is a degenerative disease of the brain and not an imbalance of brain chemicals, to turn around and give them antipsychotics, which are trying to balance out of control brain chemical is absolutely the wrong thing to do. And not only do nursing homes harm and dehumanize residents, the state often fails to react or even acknowledge the problem. So we have a lot of work to do in that regard. And in the face of longstanding nursing home problems, Americans are increasingly turning to assisted living. And one of the things that we have to understand is there really isn't a standard out there for assisted living. Uh, many people really view it as care, but it's just what it said, assistance, all right, with what we call activities of daily living. Can you get to the toilet? Can you put clothes on? Are you able to eat your food? But it's nothing more than that, although there may be a nurse to make sure that your prescribed medication gets taken. We're not painting the whole industry with that, but when you have people that are expecting to get care who may be vulnerable because of age, disease, or elsewise, and you have an unregulated industry, then you have the opportunity, unfortunately, 
to have abuse and situations that we would not want to find. So the reason I'm bringing this up is going forward, we're going to have an opportunity to bring folks from the industry in here to position what they think are the correct situations and, and what really goes on. Because one of the things most people don't know how to do, they know the word nursing home. But they don't know how to buy one. Of course. We, you know, we can buy a car, but we've never bought a nursing home until that day happens. And usually we don't have a big choice in the matter because a discharge planner at a hospital or another acute facility says, here's where you're going. You got two to pick from. You got an hour to make up your mind. Paul, I know. Uh, I think we need to take a break. I think we need to take our break. And I think that, that Dan is on the phone. And so when we come back, we're going to hear from Dan McGrath. And so stay tuned. We've got a lot of stuff to tell you and a lot of great information. CFC support helps fund research. You can, too. Each year, thousands of men and women serving their country in the U.S. military, as well as other employees of the federal government and the U.S. Postal Service, provide support for medical research to find treatments and cures for diseases. This is done through the Combined Federal Campaign, an annual workplace giving campaign that allows eligible individuals to support charities, such as those that conduct medical research, through a payroll deduction. Money donated this way to the medical research charities and its member organizations helps fund research to fight diseases from Alzheimer's to cancer, multiple sclerosis, blindness, breathing disorders, and much more. The diseases included afflict people of all ages, from the very young to the very old. You don't need to be a member of the military or a federal government employee to support research to help you or those you love that are suffering from an illness or disease. Donations to our not-for-profit tax-exempt organizations are tax-deductible and provide a vital source of funding in the fight to defeat some of life's most most dreaded diseases. Please visit the website of the Medical Research Charities, which can be found at medicalresearchcharities.org. That's all one word, medicalresearchcharities.org. On that website, you can learn more about our member charities and make a donation in support of the research they're conducting for a specific disease or family of diseases. You can make a donation to Medical Research Charities itself and support the work of all our member charities. Please visit our website today, medicalresearchcharities.org. Become a part of joining forces to find a cure. Are you a family caregiver? Are you taking care of a spouse or loved one who can no longer take care of himself or herself? Are you dealing with Alzheimer's disease and don't know what to do? Do you feel burned out, frustrated, and just don't know where to turn? You've tried doctors, lawyers, and mental health professionals and have come to realize that they don't have practical answers to these questions. What you need are experts, non-clinical family caregivers with 25 years of active experience helping thousands of family caregivers like yourself. People who can help you provide a better quality of life for yourself and your loved one. Who you need are David Levy or Paul Vadiato. Reach David at david at caregiverreality.com or reach Paul at paul at caregiverreality.com and let them help you pick the right path towards improving the quality of life for you, the caregiver, and your loved one. This is Paul Vadiato, co-host of Caregiver Reality Hour. As a spousal caregiver, I know that sometimes things get rough and sometimes we lose perspective. David Levy and I have over 50 years experience and expertise on advising caregivers. If you find that you need help, you're a little confused, reach out to us at Paul or David at caregiverreality.com. We're there to help. This is Caregiver Reality with gerontologist David Levy and caregiver expert Paul Vadiato, who asks you to call in and speak with him on the air toll free at 888-565-1470. That's 888-565-1470 to share a story or important information. Now, back to today's Caregiver Reality Show. And we're back, and um, we've got Dan holding on the line. But before we do that, as I do every week, I, t I pick one of the underlying charities uh, from medical research charities to uh, give a little shout-out to. And in the past couple of weeks, I've had two friends 
whose family members have come down or been diagnosed rather with multiple sclerosis. And so I thought tonight I would just take a moment and speak about the great work that's being done. It's called the Torrey Pines Institute for Molecular Studies, and they happen to be up in St. Lucie, Florida, and Multiple Sclerosis National Research Institute. And they conduct a lot of basic biomedical research directed towards causes, diagnosis, treatment, vaccines, and cures for MS. Their scientists are world-class researchers. They publish over 100 scientific articles each year in journals, books, and symposium proceedings. They provide lectures at universities and at scientific conferences throughout the world, and they provide training and mentoring to postdoctoral research fellows. There are a lot of diseases out there that we could have discussed today. Let's face it, Ebola is in the headlines, whatever this uh, virus 68 maybe but uh ms has been around for a long time and it affects people in their 30s 40s and early 50s and that's just too young to wind up with a neuromuscular disease so what we'd like to say is um if you've got somebody or you feel strongly about this um go to www.ms-research.org that's ms research.org look at what they do make a donation if you want to uh, they're a very worthwhile organization that's been pushing all the the frontier of what mu multiple sclerosis education training and research is all about they're a very very worthwhile organization I want to say one other thing before we go to Dan as you know Arden Court who's been one of our long-standing sponsors mm -hmm is having a program, one at uh, 1030 to 12 on uh, this Thursday, and the other one up at 12 to 4 at the Arden Court um, in West Palm. And it's called Untangling Dementia, and it's a free educational seminar, and it features a guest speaker who I know, Tam Cummings. She's a Ph.D., she's an M.S., she's a gerontologist, and she's the author of Untangling Dementia, a guide in understanding Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. She didn't write a book called How Did I Take Care of My Mother? She's a gerontologist. She's very skilled. She knows what she's talking about. And all you need to do is make a phone call. As I said, 10 o'clock on Thursday, they'll be at Arden Court in Delray. That number is 561-498-5552. 561-498-5552. Let them know you're coming, and uh, they will make room for you, even though I know that it's quickly filling up. And the Arden Court that's on Village Boulevard in West Palm Beach, you can get, reach them at 561-688-9999. 561-688-9999. Excuse me. Tell them you'd like to attend. You want to hear... Tam Cummings talk about untangling dementia. It'll be worth your while, and it's free. Paul, I think we have Dan on the line, and I think it's time to Great. Uh, Great. get going with him. Dan, are you there? I, I'm here. Can you guys hear me? Uh, we can hear you just fine, and we're looking right at your book called oh, What You, you Don't Know much. About Retirement Will Hurt You. Uh, we had you on a couple weeks ago. We did have some Skype issues, so this time the only thing we're showing is the book, and we've got you on the phone, so there won't be any issues regarding being heard and being understood. So without any further ado, I'm going to turn you over to Paul, uh, my resident uh, financial expert, and I know he's been speaking to you the last couple of days, as have I, and so uh, we want to hear that story that you told, but in a more complete and and cohesive fashion so welcome aboard hey good afternoon dan how are you doing well paul how about yourself thank you, you very well? very well dan if i may just put an introduction out there because i want people really to understand who we're speaking with today uh dan has over 20 years of broad financial and healthcare research experience uh, he's co-founder of Jester Financial Technologies, and they are the leading firm in the nation when it comes to calculating out-of-pocket health care costs in retirement. Uh, Dan is 
has authored numerous articles and publications on the topic of Medicare and health care in retirement. And his book, which you see on screen for those that are watching, What You Don't Know About Retirement Will Hurt You, serves as both a warning and a guide. And underneath, uh, on the bottom in red on the book cover, it's written by Mary Beth Franklin of Investment News, a well-respected publication in the industry. She wrote, at some po- and I quote, at some point, decades into the future, aging baby boomers and their financial advisors may look back and wonder why they didn't heed today's warnings laid out in Dan McGrath's book. Wow, Dan. That is a scary quote on the uh, cover. Uh, in a nutshell, we had so many retirees and so many people about to retire. What are they not seeing and what's not being addressed? Um, well, I mean, you guys do a very great job about uh, part of it uh, every, you know, every week on your show. Uh, but the big, the big thing that's not being addressed is the simple fact that when people retire, and now, unfortunately, starting in 2015, everyone's fully responsible for having health care. So ultimately, in retirement, people are not realizing that the majority of their health care costs, at least the premiums, co-pays, deductibles, are 100% their responsibility. And they're a lot larger than what, what we're being told and what we've planned for. And there's other impacts uh, with them as people are starting to realize that the, the health costs are deducted directly through their Social Security check when in retirement. And many people that are retired rely on that income in order just to get through, through, through the day-to-day living. So it's a question of Medicare and Social Security and the payment. And I know, and Dan, I've read your book at least two times and gone back a third time. Uh, you speak of three new rules of retirement. Would you share with our audience what those rules are and, you know, why they're so important to all of us? Sure. They're actually not, uh, they're not necessarily new. They've been on the books. We're just starting to, uh, and I've been talking about this for about uh, going on six years now, um, trying to show awareness. One of the, the, the key rule that I explain to people is you have to have health care. It's mandatory. In order for you to collect Social Security, you have to accept Medicare when eligible. Now, that means you have to accept Medicare Part A, which is free, but you also have the, the startup or the key when there's no more credible health insurance, meaning you're under an employer or spouse's employer's health plan, you have to enroll into Medicare Part B and Part D, or you have these late enrollment penalties that unfortunately build up and last for the rest of retirement. So the first rule is you have to have health costs. It, it's not it's not hidden. It's it's out there in the open, and that leads us to the, the rule of that this particular health cost is determined by how much income you're earning. So the more income that you earn in retirement, the higher these health care costs are going to be. And as I said earlier, these health costs are deducted directly from your Social Security check. Your Medicare Part B premium is automatically deducted. Your Medicare Part D premium, you have an option, and it's being highly encouraged that you automatically deduct it for the simple fact that if you miss a payment or whatever may happen later on, um, negligence on anyone's part of payment not being made, there may be also a late enrollment penalty. So you're seeing these costs being deducted directly from a Social Security check, and as I stated, Medicare is means-tested, meaning the more income you earn, the higher your Medicare premiums are going to be, and those higher premiums are also automatically deducted from someone's Social Security check. Dan, this so is David. I, I just have a, just for the benefit of the audience, because there are some people that haven't hit Medicare yet. Part B is the hospital and the doctor's. Or uh, rather, Part A is the facility. Part B is doctors and meds when you go into a facility or when you go to see a doctor under Medicare. And D is the standalone program for medication that's prescribed outside of a facility or even within that's charged to your Plan D. Is that correct? That is 100% correct. All right. So that now going forward, suppose now somebody says, well, I'm in a Medicare Advantage program, meaning I'm enrolled in one of those 
uh, organizations that has a panel of providers or maybe even a PPO where I can pretty much pick who I want to go to without a referral, and they seem to take care of everything that I do. How does it affect somebody in a Med Advantage program versus somebody that's simply enrolled in Medicare fee-for-service, the traditional Medicare that we all know or at least think we know and understand? Uh, when, when it comes to the, the income, we talk about means testing on Medicare charging people more money if they happen to earn too much income. Irregardless if you're in a what's called an original Medicare plan, which is you're accepting Medicare Part A, Part B, and then getting a standalone prescription drug plan or what's called a Medigap plan, that's original Medicare, or going to what's called a Medicare Advantage plan, irregardless, you're still subject to the income. So if you're earning too much income, those penalties are automatically assessed and deducted from your Social Security check. So even if you're in a Medicare Advantage program, your Probably. Social Security comes independently, and that is kind of the bank account that they're going to draw from. Yes, automatically. So, Dan, very quickly, summarize the three rules. So, Well, the third rule, just a real quick, is the definition of income is practically everything in your financial plan. So the first rule is you have to have health costs. The health costs are predicated on how much income you have, and income is pretty much everything that you have in your financial plan. Wow. Dan, I really enjoy reading the book, and for those of you who see it on screen, and I highly recommend that you get it. It's very, very readable. And, uh, Dan, you, you write the book from the perspective of speaking to your mom. i got to ask you, Dan, is she really that tough? Um, uh, a Sicilian woman off the boat living in the projects growing up uh, in, in East Boston. Uh, yeah, she's, nice. uh, she's that tough. Yeah, <laughs> close to heart. I know what you mean. Dan, Dan, why has this had such a long fuse, so to speak? It kind of was enacted, so to speak, or written into the law all the way back in 2003. And recognizing that in 2015, the leading edge of the boomers will have to start taking their mandatory drawdowns on their IRAs and other income accounts that may not have been part of the equation up until now and will really blossom forward in 2018. Because I think you told us the last time that you were on that the cutoffs for, you know, I, I think you said for an individual making more than or earning more than $69,000, and I think it was a couple, was eighty nine or 90000 Please excuse me if I didn't have the numbers, but they seemed rather dramatic and substantially cut from what we've been used to. Um, could you speak a little more to that issue? Okay, yes. <clears throat> uh, in, the, in the first part of why this is at such a long fuse, is if you just look at the target, if you just look at the baby boomer generation, they're the ones that have actually been changing the face of our country, changing the face of the, basically the world as they've gone through their growth spurts. So basically when they started to have children, everything was how do we do college planning? Now college planning is becoming, is, is, is secondary. It's, it's, second, it's second nature, I mean. Uh, as they entered, you know, their 50s, they started looking at retirement, and everything was focused on retirement. Now they're entering Social Security, and you're seeing lots of financial firms talk about Social Security. They haven't started using the health care system because they're not that, they haven't hit that advanced agement yet, and that large demographic. Yes, we've had plenty of people go through it. Currently, there's about 42 to 46 million people on Medicare but that 76 million people that are about to come through over the next 17 years, that's where we're going to see the change. And what's happening with inside the federal government is they're, they're seeing this change. So as you stated about these income brackets, currently today, Medicare is looking at someone's income level and saying if it's an individual and they're earning over $85,000, they're going to be subject to a penalty. And the penalty goes up to as much as $214,000 based on income, and there'll be a, a higher penalty. For, for couples, 
what they've done is they've just taken that penalty amount of 85000 or more and doubled it. So couples earning over 170000 will be subject to the penalty. Well, unfortunately, what's being proposed by the House Ways and Means Committee, by the presidential uh, fiscal budget of 2014, as well as the Bipartisan Policy Center, these brackets are expected to be changed in 2016, and they're expected to be dropped by um, uh, as little as 11 percent to as much as 47 percent. So the proposed brackets are expected to be about $60,000 for an individual, and all the way down from 170 to 90 thousand dollars for a couple. So what we're expecting to see come 2016 more and more retirees that have to take out the requirement of distribution, coupled with maximizing their social security benefit, uh, being subject to this, this Medicare means testing in a much more harsh way, and they're going to end up unfortunately losing more of their social security check and seeing their taxes, unfortunately, increase as well. Just to go a little bit off track for a second, uh, Dan, assuming no major illness, nothing long-term, a couple that is retiring at age 65, what might they expect to spend out of pocket uh, on things like premiums, deductibles, uh, over-the-counter things, eyeglasses and such, over their normal life expectancy, and what about inflation? Uh, well, inflation, that's, uh, that's interesting. The overall health care inflation, according to the Department of Health and Human Services, is projected to be at least 6.2% going through 2020, uh, 2022. Historically, Medicare has been inflating at over 7.5%. That's going all the way back to 1967 when looking at Medicare premiums through 2020. 2014. So the inflation rate's expecting to be high. Currently today, a couple that retires at the age of 65 is looking at spending about $8,100 for their Medicare Part B and D premiums, along with a Medigap Plan F policy. It's not including any deductibles, any co-pays. It's not including any going to the dentist not including their eyes, uh, getting their eyes checked or hearing aids for coverage for a couple that's in the maximum bracket that's earning too much income they're looking at paying about sixteen thousand five hundred dollars so now if we just apply the inflation rate and we look at a couple that plans on living to say age 85 a couple that's earning under the medicare income bracket today is looking at paying on average about three hundred and twenty to three hundred and sixty thousand dollars just on Medicare premiums alone. Wow. A couple that plans on earning too much income, or the maximum, especially if these brackets adjust, they can expect to pay about $800,000 for the Medicare premiums alone. That is just frightening. Well, it gets worse. Unfortunately, <laughs> oh, for somebody that's 55, you. and if we look at the same inflation rate, a 55-year-old couple that retires at 65 and then lives till age 85 is looking at about 470 to $520,000 in out-of-pocket Medicare costs. Uh, a couple earning the maximum is looking at a minimum of $1.2 million. Once again, this is coming directly out of your Social Security check. So for anybody telling you that Social Security is going to go bankrupt, well, they're nuts. We will, but they won't. Unfortunately, Medicare will be inflating at such a level that the Medicare premiums will be taking away any cost of living adjustment Social Security may be giving. And for those that are earning too much income, they're not protected by what is called the Hold Harmless Act, meaning that your Medicare premiums can only be as much as your Social Security COLA. So you're, if you're not held harmless, you're... Medicare premiums can be more than your Social Security COLA, thus you lose Social Security, a part of it each year. There, if you look at the numbers, by the year 2030, Social Security should have a surplus with inside its trust fund. So it's possible that Social Security wouldn't cover the cost of Medicare, and are you saying that uh, the individual might have to write a check? Oh, yeah, it's already happening. What do you mean by that, Dan? So let's take a look at an example for clients that I helped out that I helped in New York. A lot of teachers uh, earning 
top dollar uh, spouses may have been a doctor. Uh, she or he may have been a, been an investor. The example that I give is that they owned a lot of real estate property, have a lot of real estate income, and they were teachers. So they have a pension, each of them coming in at roughly $100,000 for a pension in the state of New York. So they're automatically in the, in the next, in the highest, one of the higher brackets. Then they have rental income coming in and they're being put over, they're putting over the, the Medicare maximum. New York does not pay into Social Security, but if you have another outside job, you can still qualify for Social Security. So they're, they apply for Social Security to receive it, but what happens is their Social Security benefit isn't as much as the, the max Medicare premium for Part B plus the penalty for Part D. So each, mm. each quarter, every three months, they have to write a check to the federal government for what Social Security didn't cover for their Medicare premiums. And then the cherry on top, they're going to be, well, they not going to be, they have been taxed on the income they never received because the federal government raised the medical loss ratio, the loss deduction. Uh, is, is that what we now have as 7.5% of adjusted gross? We can take our medical expenses above that? Yes. And that's going to 10 uh, next year? Next year? I think it's, 20, it's either 2015 or 2017, one of the two years. Okay, and is, is it going to end or is it, or is it going to go up? going to go up okay from seven and a half to where just so we can give everybody a bad night's sleep going to 10 and i wouldn't be shocked if it would be going to 15 to 20 before 2025 wow dan it sounds like a movie hiding in plain sight where (laughs) this information while available seems to be invisible to most people about to retire and correct me if I'm wrong, but to many, many of the planners who are helping these people look forward and seeing if they're going to have enough money for their lifetime. Am I incorrect on that? You're, you're spot on. The, the, the biggest frustration on, on my end, um, which I write about in the book, is that the financial industry is unfortunately asleep at the wheel. They are still encouraging people to put as much money into their 401k, their traditional 401k is possible. They're looking at showing people to put money into a traditional IRA or the tax deferral. Don't pay the tax today, pay the tax later on. And what they don't realize is that the definition of income when it comes to your health is your adjusted gross income plus any tax exempt interest you may have or everything on lines 37 and 8B of the IRS 1040, which is everything with the exception of Withdrawals from Roth accounts, withdrawals from 401H plans, very specific annuities, and life insurance. That's it. Well, you can use reverse mortgages, which are fantastic, but I don't consider that an investment strategy. That is a, that's a, an income distribution strategy, but that's it. So in addition to the income planning, which has been traditional retirement planning, there really is a separate planning of health care planning. And in your book, you speak of the three holy grails of health care planning. Be yeah. more specific, if you would. Well, the three holy grails we try to break down is very simplistically as, as the Roth life insurance and annuities. Those are the, the most accessible to people. And it's really not that complicated to solve and to control these costs, especially on, on the side that, that we speak about now. On your side with long-term care, it's a different different world. But on our end, when we speak about, about Medicare premiums and, and controlling that, it's as simple as speaking to your employer instead of, instead of having your 401K contribution or 403B contribution going into a traditional IRA, you place it into a Roth IRA, a Roth 401K. Which means you pay the taxes today. Yes. So if you look at... I. I I write a couple examples on JesterFinancial.com. If you look at somebody that's earning, say, $75,000 a year, the difference that they're going to, the tax savings that they're going to receive today over the course of a 20-year work period, I think it's a 25-year work period, if they do tax deferrals, about $200,000 over the course of that 25 years, which is a substantial savings. 
But then if they retire at the age of 65 and live to the age of 85, and you factor in these health care costs plus the taxation of the, the withdrawal from the traditional 401K, they're giving the government $1.2 million. Dan, um, in the world that Paul and I live in, which is not always, I don't mean us personally, although we, we, we see it every day with our spouses and even to some degree with ourselves, expecting to live to 85 and not have some significant health care event at this point in, in, in the way we see health care and also based on the fact that many of the boomers um, are overweight, don't exercise, uh, may have diabetes and a number of other what I'll call social uh, infirmities. Mm-hmm. It, it really doesn't spell out a, a, a very good situation because y- you're in, in your book, What to Know About, Retir- about Retirement Will Hurt You, you're really expecting all of these people to stay healthy. You, you've kind of factored away having a heart attack, getting dementia, uh, having a stroke, or having some significant medical event uh that isn't completely covered by medicare that requires medications that also have a high out of pocket or uh you know whatever may be additional costs aids and services because if you can't get and afford a facility you're going to be doing it at home so really what you've done when you talk about these numbers you've really cast them in light of a very very healthy to so to speak best case couple. scenario right it's a yeah. best case scenario predicated in a world that is not displaying that best case as a practical set of circumstances uh, did that make sense yeah, it makes all the sense in the world and the decision to, to do that was to just show people the hard part is the hurdle that we have is explaining to people that you haven't factored in a cost that's going to be the largest expense that you're going to face in retirement in possibly quite possibly your entire life Mm -hmm. you haven't factored in it at all right and now we're going to hit you with not only just the very simplistic expenses that you're going to receive but then about the expenses that you guys talk about where is the responsibility in your mind of the financial advisory industry. And I mean, I recognize that you discovered this six years ago and as part of doing, you know, your homework, which was 2008, which was already five years after this had kind of been cast in some concrete. Um, Recognizing that you really did your homework, how can an entire industry not at least have some other bellwethers besides yourself or or folks that have you know written in like uh, Paul Revere and sounded a warning that this stuff is out there I mean I commend you for doing it but why is it so singular that you're one of the few people that's brought this to the attention of the American public or for that matter even the financial advisory community right it, it, it goes right back to it doesn't fit into the sales process of the financial industry. The financial industry, what they're guilty of, I will say, is not uh, lack of compassion or um, uh, calculation or fraud. What they're, what they're guilty of is laziness. They're going to react to what the consumer wants without looking forward to what the consumer needs. So in other words, they're being reactive rather than being proactive even if they knew this, don't bring the bad news until the client asks you about it. You'd be shocked. Uh, there's a gentleman that talks a lot about the IRA, the IRA time bomb. Um, he happens to have a few people that represent him, and their mantra is don't tell the client any bad news. Wow. That's unfortunate. Dan, it almost seems unethical. Yes. Um, no, I, I believe it's unethical because when, when we talk about like the three holy grails, the solution to controlling the cost isn't that difficult. So with the, one of the easiest ways to do it is life insurance. That one of the most simplistic ways to control 
all of the costs, including long-term care, is instead of placing money into the stock market where you don't know where the return's going to be, you place it, not all of it, but you, you work with a financial advisor that understands this and you place some money into what's called a, a whole life insurance policy or an indexed universal life policy that has some guarantees. And then what's great is you can throw a long-term care rider on it or a chronic care rider on it that can help, God forbid, if you need that home care or a spouse needs that home care, there's funds there. So the solutions, what's really mind-boggling to me is not only the financial industry being reactive and not being proactive, but this conversation lends itself directly to the instruments and products and investments that they're selling. And over and above that cost of care, it's what it actually does to the family, which is more in our wheelhouse. These two issues, there's no question, go hand in hand. Hand in hand. So it's like going to the doctor and expecting him to, you know, as a trusted authority for medicine, just like the financial advisor is a trusted authority for your planning in that respect. And you don't know to raise the issue about a disease that the doctor knows that you have. But since you haven't asked about it, they don't have an issue in not telling you about it, which uh, in the medical world would get your license taken away. That's for well, you're, sure. You're, you're, you're gone. You, you're, no, you're, no long, you're no longer a doctor. Right. Dan, we're going to need to be wrapping it up. Believe it or not, we're almost out of time. Uh, where can people get your book? And what final words do you have before we need to say goodnight to everyone? Well, for final words is thank you very much for the time and opportunity. And I'm, I'm hoping people take the message that you, you two are bringing because it's, it's truly important. Uh, for more information, for a free report, uh, access to the book, Please uh, see our site at www.yarretirementcost.org. That's cost with an S. Okay. There people can do a quick calculation, have access to the full, ser full service software, and if they want the book, is there as well. All right, Dan, uh, that's our song. So, uh, South Florida, America, and the world, you've been listening to Caregiver Reality Hour. Dan, you have just been fantastic. I hope people take this to heart and go back to their financial planners and say what's going on and what can i do about this we'll be back next week tuesday five o'clock drive time paul good night everyone have a great week and please caregivers take care of yourselves thanks for joining us for this week's caregiver reality show each week, David Levy, a gerontologist, and Paul Badiato, a caregiver expert with a combined over 25 years of experience providing practical and realistic help to caregivers struggling to keep up with the needs of a loved one who are unable to care for himself or herself. To reach David Levy, email him at david at caregiverreality.com or to reach Paul Badiato, email paul at caregiverreality.com. And find out more online. Just go to caregiverreality.com. See you next week for another exciting show of Caregiver Reality.